Hey everyone, it's Jarrett, your favorite Canadian. Thank you so much for coming to check out this Canada Explained video this week. If you haven't already, consider pressing that subscribe button. It helps us out a lot. This week, we're checking out the connection between the Second World War and the province of Alberta. This is Project Habakkuk. It was the second half of the Second World War, and the United Kingdom and their allies were facing a bit of a challenge. See, the Germans had already taken most of continental Europe by 1942, and the UK's biggest saving grace was the fact that it was, in fact, an island. The Germans hadn't been able to break over the channel to take the United Kingdom, and so it was from there that the Allies, Canada included, prepared to fight back and eventually liberate the continent from Nazi control. But the island needed to be supplied somehow, and it was practiced that Canada and the United States would ship as much food, ammunition, ships, planes, and anything else they might need across the ocean in gigantic convoys. And the bigger the better, because lurking just below the surface and scattered all across the Atlantic were German U-boats that were ready to attack and sink ships in the convoy. The more there were, the more likely that some of them were going to make it across the ocean. The ships had a hard time making out and defending themselves against the U-boats. But planes, they were faring much better. They could pick out the U-boat under the surface easier, they could drop bombs and depth charges directly onto the submarines. Air escorts could only make it so far from land to protect the convoys before being forced to turn around, leaving the ships alone in the ocean until they could be met by planes coming in from the other side. This space in between, called the Mid-Atlantic Gap, is where most of the Allied ships met their fate. If only there was a way to build a massive aircraft carrier to put right in the middle of the gap. One that's big enough to serve as a base for planes, and that's strong enough to defend itself against a U-boat attack, in the likely case that they tried. The British Navy knew that this would be prohibitively expensive to build. Not to mention that all of the steel needed to build such a ship was already badly needed in other places, like the tank, gun, bomb, and bullet factories. Enter Jeffrey Pike, a Jewish engineer who had gone to Berlin at the start of the war to gauge German sentiment at the time. He was arrested by the SS, sent to a concentration camp, managed to escape, smuggled himself into the Netherlands, and then back to England. He published a book on the whole ordeal before the end of the war itself, which was one of the first first-hand accounts of life within the Nazi camps. This gave him an out from the rest of the war in the UK, and he was able to spend his time focusing on some rather interesting propositions. Pike reflected long and hard about the question of how to protect the Atlantic convoys that were out of the reach of air cover, and given the supply of steel and aluminium was needed for other things, his answer was ice. I mean, the North Atlantic is famous for its icebergs, so he thought, why not just shave the top flat, pop a hanger or two on top, and float the giant ice aircraft carrier out into the middle of the ocean. He figured that the ice could be made using only 1% of the energy needed to make the same amount of steel, and water's pretty much free, so he thought it was going to be incredibly cheap. That is until someone pointed out that icebergs are usually pointy, most of their mass sits under the surface of the water, and when they melt, they have a tendency to flip over. Pike worked with a team of scientists to develop a new kind of ice-like material called pycrete, named after Pike. It's essentially wood chips that are mixed into water before being frozen. This made the ice melt a lot slower, and it made it significantly stronger, something the Mythbusters put to test and actually confirmed a few decades later. Pike sent note of his idea to Lord Mountbatten, who was the chief of combined operations, who then passed the idea on to British Prime Minister Winston Churchill. Churchill loved the idea, and he funded a prototype project worth about £700,000, or about £31 million today. The British paid for 300,000 tons of wood pulp, 35,000 tons of timber, and 10,000 tons of steel. Canada was chosen as the country to do the test, given the country's climate and our strong workforce that's already used to working in cold and icy conditions. They chose Patricia Lake in Jasper's National Park in Alberta, and they built a small prototype boat of pycrete that was 8 meters long and 9 meters wide. The model was built by conscientious objectors to the war, people who protested the draft and were given other jobs to do somewhere in Canada, but they were never actually told about what they were building. Churchill was so confident in the Pycrete plan that he had a piece brought to the Conference of Quebec City in 1943 with Prime Minister Mackenzie King and American President Roosevelt. He set up a quick demonstration. Out in front of the Citadel, Lord Mountbatten laid out a regular block of ice and a block of Pycrete. 
He took out a pistol and fired a shot into the ice, shattering the block and lodging the bullet into the ground. He then turned and shot the Pycrete, which withstood the shot, ricocheted back and grazed the leg of a nearby admiral. Canada was confident that it was going to be able to deliver a Pycrete ship in 1944. The plan, dubbed Operation Habakkuk, was absolutely insane, like not even remotely logical. They planned to build a ship that was 1.2 kilometers long and over 180 meters wide. That's almost 100 times bigger than the model that was built in Alberta. And just for size comparison, here is the Boeing factory in Everett, Washington, which is the largest building in the world by floor space. And here is the Habakkuk. Oh, and here is the size of an actual aircraft carrier. The Pycrete model in Alberta was having some trouble. A phenomenon called cold flow meant that the frozen material was sagging, and it was obvious that steel reinforcements and additional insulation would be needed to keep the ship afloat. This led to some changes in the plans for the actual frozen ship. If it was actually built, it would need 12 giant motors hung out on the side and sat out in the water because of the sheer amount of heat that they would produce would have melted the ship. Then a gigantic refrigeration plant, the size of a small apartment complex, would be needed to keep the entire ship at a chilly minus 16 degrees Celsius to keep it from sagging. Could you even imagine what it would have been inside for those sailors? Out at sea for months at a time in an environment like that. It would have been like being outside in a Calouette in March, 24 hours a day. One study found that just the refrigeration system alone to keep the 1.2 kilometer long ice ship frozen in the ocean would have needed more steel than goes into 12 normal aircraft carriers. So slowly, Churchill and the team in Canada and the rest of the British Admiralty realized just how dumb Pike's plan was. Despite his pleas to continue, the project was scrapped in 1944 when the Portuguese allowed the Allies to use the Azores Islands, and new extended range planes from the Cancar facility in Fort William meant that the mid-Atlantic gap just was no longer a thing. Hey, if you've made it this far, it must mean that you enjoy these stories and we enjoy having you around, so if you haven't already, maybe like the video, leave us a comment below, subscribe, and press that little bell icon so that you get notified next time we put out a video.